So Eric is the, the longtime um, leader of the uh, Bromax North Constellation Project. Uh, he has a number of other strings to his bow as well, so I'm sure you may hear about it as well. Uh, I won't steal any more of his thunder, and you can have the chat. HDMI or BT? HDMI. This is HDMI, but you can have it. Oh, yeah. I think there's only HDMI. Um, Bumble Thank you, Mark. Yes, uh, let's see. I'll try to be brief here so we have time for discussions. If you have any short questions, go right ahead and interrupt me. But if you have these longer discussions, I think it's better to take them afterwards for everybody's sake. Uh, the given title of this uh, session was standardization of file formats. The first thing is that we're not going to standardize file formats. Because you have no idea. We made this mistake in BioExcel, and you have no idea what standards are. We might have some common file formats. Pushing things through a standardization body takes at least a decade, and it's exceptionally difficult. Um, and we actually got some of the reviewers nailing us for that, that you haven't standardized file formats. So unless you expect to push this through ISO or ECMA, it's not going to be a standard, and I don't think we can do that. But we might have some de facto standards. Um, I actually realized that we wrote one of these 10 simple rules based on some frustration of Arne and me this summer, and uh, boss, and I think we'll be out in a few weeks or so. Uh, and I'm not going to repeat this, but uh, hey, when it, either when it comes out or in the breaks, uh, do interrupt me and uh, get to me and I can share some of this with you. But uh, since Mark told we should think of needs, I will uh, adapt some of my points here to the needs we saw here. And I think most of the needs here were based on frustrations that when we read, uh, read this, most of the papers we review or edit in PLOS, it's really difficult, or it's where we can see that it is going to be really difficult for anybody to reproduce their results. The other thing that came up, there are a couple of vendors nowadays that are starting to, for competitive reasons, because it's a tough business, right, have force fields, for instance, that are closed, encrypted parameters. And while many of these force fields are great, and I, in terms of developing new drugs, it will actually be exceptionally successful. The scientists and me also worry is that if we're increasingly starting to close our parameters and everything, at some point this is going to start to impede scientific progress. Um, so we also had a fairly extensive discussion how we want to handle this in POS. So I'm not going to go through all the rules here, but I think most of these rules are really based on the ability of me, or the ability of you to reproduce and check my results, because there will be bugs in my results. The only question is how severe those bugs are, and can we find them sooner rather than later? And also the whole idea of standing on the shoulders of giants, right? That you should be able to use my results to advance your research and vice versa, and this requires us to have some sort of reasonable amount of sharing. Then, of course, you have to balance this because I'm, I'm not religious about this. I'm not out to kill commercial companies. It's perfectly fine to make money from software, even though we don't. Uh, well, in a way, we do, right? Because we get grant funding from software, most of us. Uh, and part of this has to really reproducibility, reproducibility, reproducibility. It's probably the things that comes back most of these. Uh, and then a part of this fair data <coughs> repository. So it's not enough to share your data. It also has to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, just dumping a pile of data on you, although it's theoretically possible to get the information out, you will, in most cases, not be able to do it easily. And then at the end, be nice. That's way more important than you think. But rather than spending more time on that, I'm, I had a couple of I, I will, I'm deliberately then brief on these slides. Most of them I created over the weekend or yesterday night, based on our discussions. Uh, so I, if we take a step back, then why do we even need common file formats? It's very easy to start with the assumption that uh, that is what we need or that is the goal. Uh, and I think it's good to be realistic here. Because if we're going to have joint file formats, it will be difficult to fund them. We can certainly fund the development for one or a few labs, right? But most funding cycles are two, three, maybe up to five years. But if these formats are really going to be standard, that's a 20-year commitment for all of us. And if we take on a 20-year commitment, by definition, it's not going to be funded. So what are we willing to do, assuming that we didn't have a cent of funding for it? And in my case of egotism, it's a first, encouraging reuse of existing data is certainly nice, promoting science, blah, blah, blah. But for me, it's like, if I can make it trivial, if I suspect that there is a bug, either in my program or some other program, if I could tell the student to take that file and run it through the other program, oh my god. We would save so much time. 
uh, or for whatever reason there's a new piece of hardware or you're running simulations so I get access to a huge amount either of open CL GPUs or a platform where I have to run GPU only. If I could take the same file, fully specified, run it through Android instead of Chromex. That would simplify things. Or I need to do docking. For whatever reason there is some feature that had or doesn't support. Those might happen. If I can push this with the docking program instead. That would save me time and effort as a user instead of a developer. Uh, there are certainly many of us working as any sort of high throughput usage, as long as it's a single program, it's usually fine, right? But again, uh, so I have a pipeline of five, six different steps. Suddenly, I want to introduce a seventh step. So the mere fact that there are easy ways to exchange data would make life simpler for me and my students. And then we have all these important points with reproducibility. Uh, for me, reproducibility is a great way of finding bugs, but sure, there it's, it's certainly great if I have to go back to a simulation that we can do it later. I think this is important for all of us, but I'm not entirely sure what the strong egotistic driving force here is. Uh, so we're all these, I think I'm increasing kind of, we need well-defined formats, we need interoperable formats. It's great if we can start to share these formats, not so much to have the universal standard, but to share the load of maintaining them. Uh, but I would argue that formal standard is not what we should aim for. Uh, and in the terms of the plus discussion and everything, that good file formats that include everything might mildly enforce users to store all the important metadata that we talked about that just came up in the discussion. Simply because the format, you can't write the format without having that plus data. Then Mark already mentioned a bit, I, I would largely separate things into uh, I'm an empty person, so I'll, I'll use some empty terminology here. But when I say trajectory data, it's very, large amounts of coordinate data. Amounts that are so large that the storage requirements start to matter. Uh, we're not going to do this in clear text because it would be insane. And in this case, what we haven't had before, but we have some new formats I will share a little bit with you. And I think it's having some record of prominence is important. It's, a, it's not the same thing as FAIR, but for a given program, where what program generated this data? Was it Eric Lindahl in 2001? Oh my god, then you should be careful, don't trust that student. Uh, but also, what specific run generated? What was, again, was that the buggy version of the program? Uh, what was the previous step? If I'm simulating this particular IN channel, yeah, that's all fine and good, but what PDB file did you start from? And you could argue, yeah, but that's, do you really need to know what PDB file you started from? Well, maybe we could do it the opposite way. If I'm browsing around in the PDB, could I find anybody who has ever done docking or simulation based on this PDB structure? That's starting to be something pretty important you could mine, right? And find out everybody who started this with computational methods. The compromise for this is that efficiency beats readability here. Uh, this has to be very highly compressed. Uh, and we also need to allow future even better compression algorithms compared with video. There are new compression algorithms coming all the time as processors get faster. I, we certainly need lossless compression, but we also need lossy compression to save space. Uh, you need very efficient parallel I.O. as we're getting larger and larger machines. We, I would argue we need some sort of hashes and digital signatures, partly, well, partly to uh, make sure that you can manipulate the data, but also as the amount of storage is growing, there will be random errors in data. And it's great to see, it's sad if a random error happened in the data, but it's much better to know that there is something wrong with this file because the hash does not match. And then historically, we focused on storage of full trajectories. I'm increasingly thinking, based on what assemblies or somebody's discussion yesterday, that for some large systems, even single coordinate frames or confirmations or whatever we call it, are getting so large that we might actually need to start thinking of an efficient way of storing that too. But that then becomes a balance. Because one of the things we, in the old days, we had formats that were just raw coordinates. The problem with that is that they are literally just raw coordinates. You have no idea what the atom is. And then you need to remember to pair this with the corresponding file describing the system. We don't do that in our new formats because we figured that that header describing the system is so small compared to the thousands of frames of storage. If you're only storing one frame, that balance is less obvious. The other half here is, has to do with force fields, option, metadata, everything that is not the raw coordinates. Uh, and here I would strongly prefer doing the exact opposite. Do it in Verbiton detailed formats, all the units, all choices documented. This should fully, together with a coordinate input, this should fully describe the simulations of what we're doing. Uh, ideally, I would like to be able to combine all this in a single file that I can transmit either over the wire or uh, on an email or something. And if you just run that file through 
two different programs, apart from statistical fluctuations with random numbers, compilers and everything. Again, within the statistical estimate, you, this should provide the same results in three different simulation codes. Uh, the challenge here is that you're going to need very high performance textile. The good thing is that people have already solved that problem. Uh, anytime we try to do this ourselves, we unsolve the problem. Um, <laughs> So here, don't write this ourselves. There are a handful of code of languages we standards we can think of using in there. On the other hand, this type of data is likely more difficult to write because it's not just plain n-dimensional arrays of coordinates. So uh, for this to work, not only do you need like, some sort of good frameworks to build them upon, but I think we will also need to jointly take on creating some sort of reference implementations that are completely free so any code can just incorporate them, no strings attached. The problem here is that whenever we have these discussions, I think we've had them four times before, um, what this frequently results is that you have meetings like this, or email lists. We had one probably 15 years ago uh, about molecular file formats. Everybody was so enthusiastic, and you came up with the QMM formats, how we're going to describe multiple ensembles, how we're going to describe arbitrary extensions of force fields, um, how you will enable the user to do anything, or short versus long formats and everything. Uh, and the beauty thing would look like after four months, everybody finally agreed, and that was one of them. Great, so, so how are we going to do the implementation? And then the entire list went quiet. <laughs> uh, so don't do that mistake again. Uh, we need to focus, I think, think what we must do, not what we can do. What is the minimal grain we can start from? If that is successful, it's going to be easier to build momentum to continue. But don't think, don't go for creating the kitchen sink right away. I have a couple of proposals here. Uh, when it comes to trajectory data, I think we should think of sort of Matroska containers or QuickTime or something. It has a sort of framework container that enables you to get access just the protein on frame 445 or whatever time step, but the actual compression, let that be sort of a black box inside it. Uh, because just with QuickTime, right? QuickTime now has H265. But you open them with the same programs and everything. For me as a user, I don't have to care deep. If I, if I just update my software, I can read H.265 frames with it. So some sort of container around it, and then the internal contents can be different. Uh, you need lots of portability and everything, but that's fine. That just works for movies magically. Uh, there are some fancy modern compression algorithms where you have multi-frame compressions just with movies that we would like to. We certainly want fast random access. In terms of focusing on what we must have here, I would advocate focus on the state, and that means coordinates and velocities. Possibly some sort of, if the number of atoms are changing, even if we don't implement it right away, we need to allow the number of atoms to change between time steps, or if you're doing, say, dynamic protonation or something. Uh, but everything else can, in theory, at least be recomputed from the state. And if it can be recomputed, I would say don't store it here. Actually, the way we've defined this, we can store it, but that's not necessarily a must. So I will have, yes, I do a little bit fun. I'll show you two, three slides from one project that we're still not really, we have it in Growbikes, but we're not really pushing it that hard. Uh, so what we define here is, first we have, we have a, we define the entire file format in terms of blocks. So at the start of a trajectory, you can have some sort of general information about the entire trajectory. But then, when we start reading, I need some sort of block describing what is the molecule. And that describes not this, for now at least, we haven't described all the parameters and everything. But this should be enough for me and D to visualize the molecule without also requiring a coordinate file. You want the connectivity, you want the atoms, some basic information, maybe charges or so. Uh, we can have some sort of constant data, free energy, lambda stuff, etc. And then we have these frame sets. In one example, a frame set could be one, just one frame of data. But in general, the idea is that this could be a batch of, say, 10 frames. And if I can compress those frames together, I might get better compression than just compressing one of them, just a the video. But then we also need some sort of particle maps or something to allow the number of particles to change. Again, the point here is not the details, but the hierarchical, the hierarchical. And the, the frame set here would then have a label what type of compression you have with a particular frame set. And with this arbitrary data, you could also store any type of the derived or measured data that you also spoke about. What we did with TNG, uh, and again, I'm not <coughs> advocating that this is the solution, but just some things that come up. One of the reasons why we wanted something compressed is that this is the problem when you use pretty much almost text-based formats or bad binary formats. They become insanely large. TRR is a non-compressed format, and just as the charm file formats. Uh, if you use NetCDF that's used for Hammer, for instance, they're also fairly bad. You can compress them a bit, then the game may be a factor of 30% or so. 
Ecstasy that is horrible in some ways, but the reason we love ecstasy in Roblox is that it's fairly small. TNT for normal data, the same way we use ecstasy is some 50% smaller. But if you use velocity data or anything, uh, TNT will be like 50% smaller than ecstasy. Uh, there was even there was even somebody that got in touch with us online a few years ago that, that, that came up with an even better performance. I think we should be able to test case to get this down to say 40% of XTC or something. Can you comment on why the difference between NetCDF and TNG? NetCDF supports compression. Um, yeah, but they don't in Amber by default. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't think I, I think that let's see, there was a while ago we wrote this paper. This is the default file, this is one of the file formats used in Amber, and there they do not support compression. I mean, can you at least say something about the merits of like, something like a, a, a hand-rolled format like TNG versus a, a very general, well-supported infrastructure like NetCDF? Is there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, we, we actually looked a lot into both NetCDF and HDF5. Okay. One of the problems with these is the size of the code base. HDF5 is pretty much the size of Romex, and it's larger than Amber. It's a gigantic code base. And then you have a problem with a new computer, such as the K-computer. It didn't build on the K-computer originally. So, T, I'm not saying that TNT is bug free. The point is, which one would you rather be bug? 200 kilobytes or 8 megabytes of code? Mm -hmm. It's also fairly advanced code. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not arguing that we should not use HDF5. That in principle, I love the idea that their community is supported, right? If you start to search and run for HDF5, there are quite a few users who are very unhappy with the performance to get for IO, in fact, in parallel IO with HDF5. And I'm not saying that that HDF5 is problem, but HDF5 is essentially recreating a file system within their formats, and if you use that the wrong way, you can very easily end up with things that are horribly bad. Uh, so again, the point here is not advocating, but the problem is that all these things are a balance. You can have either compact or something that's optimized for what we need, or generality. I think having both of them might be difficult. Uh, when it comes to the parameter data, I need to wrap this up. Uh, I would argue that just taking this very simple key value trees, and uh, one of the reasons for that, we've seen that even the last EK, formats keep evolving. There are new formats popping up. There will be a new format 10 years from now that nobody has had any idea of. But if it's a simple key value tree, that's something that we can encode in any format. I think a lot of us have dabbled more or less in XML, and the problem with XML is that it's, but it's, it's also one of these standards by committee things, right? It sounds great with attributes and complex objects and everything, but it also makes it non-trivial to translate XML to other objects. Uh, I would propose to go with JSON right now uh, as a subset of YAML, also because there are very small and very fast implementations. Uh, metadata for everything would be awesome, but again, focus on what we must do, not what we can do. In principle, I think it's a reasonable goal to have a single JSON file containing an entire simulation starting state. So that, again, I can do the simulation. Then. The problem if that's going to be everything, that would also have to include the entire force field. And what do you then do if you have an example of 10,000 runs? Do I really want to encode the force field 10,000 times? Of course, you can have an external link to the force field. Yeah, but then the file is no longer self-contained. And the more I'm thinking about that, I think, yes, it's better to reproduce it. It's better to reproduce the force field 10,000 times. Because these formats are not going to be gigantic anyway. You can't compress them. And that the bit of compression, and, and again, most of us don't fill our hard drives with JSON files. So that having a clear specification to me, the more I think of it, is probably more important than doing this bit of pre-render optimization. Sorry, there was one more thing. One, one argument for why I'm increasingly negative to XML is that if you just look at Google Trends, XML is not on a good path here. It keeps going down, while JSON, well, it's not going up anymore, but it's fairly constant. So I think that the JSON tools are in general better. But again, there will be something new in a few years. This is the other reason why I like JSON. Uh, the other, <coughs> I'm gonna find out, maybe we should not even think so much about file formats, but how are we gonna share and things more than standards for how do I get JAWS data? If I could get JAWS data, I really don't care that much if it's an Amber or some other format, because I can likely write that, have a converter locally. Uh, so if they, could I get an easy way, just with a single command, I could get all the simulation data for this DUI and get it all down to my local hard drive. And if we, at the hour at we do control directly or indirectly a large part of the community, and we get all the major codes and community starts pushing this, it would happen. 
The point here is we talked a little bit about yesterday, are there any such standards? It has to be extremely resilient. Uh, it should not go down because of a server or a few servers goes down. It should be distributed in some way. I think that we initially should focus on storing only the metadata that allow the role trajectories to be stored elsewhere. And the great thing, we have such a technology developed this week, not by me, but by other people, and it's called the Pirate Page. <laughs> <laughs> and you're laughing. But this is a system that the MPAA and tons of lawyers have not been able to take down. I would argue this is far more resilient than any argument. So that, again, legality is aside, and I'm not suggesting that we should distribute our performance through the Pirate Page, right? There's something to say for resilience. It is a technique that works. The other nice thing is that the more people that you download from multiple sources and the more popular a file or data is, the greater the bandwidth. It's going to be available in many places. It's trivial for me to pull down John's data, Lucy's data. If, in theory, if uh, somebody has a director with movies, right, that, that also tends to see. So maybe we should think in terms of having the metadata tracker, but my, or the group's own data repository would also be the shared repository, that if I have Joel's files, if anybody asks for Joel's files, suddenly the, the network knows that those are available in Europe too, and I can get them from Stockholm, and then you double the bandwidth. Um, so this is a bit tongue-in-cheek, but uh, arguably, if you look at the Pirate Bay, <coughs> I've heard, uh, there are tons of different platforms, right? The programs are able to read many of the movie formats, but the sharing happens because it's easy to share, not because they agreed on one common format for all the movies. Uh, so I think I'm done there. Uh, but some points to keep up the discussion here. The sad part, no standard is going to evolve from a single lab. Uh, we need buy-in from several labs, in particular you. Uh, I think we need to be a bit honest here. What can we each of us contribute concretely, and what would we be willing to have next month? Not just next month, but in the long term. Uh, and there I think it is important, what will we get from it? Because that's important. We might have to do a whole lot of this work for free. And if there is no tangible benefit from doing this two years from now, on, we might not be quite as enthusiastic. And I want to avoid the situation that we're having in yet another workshop in five years where we're saying that it would be great if we had some sort of common file formats, because we've been there done that. Uh, so maybe we should, I would encourage all of us to think more in terms of compromising to make it feasible rather than getting a perfect file format. And don't do the mistake that we did 15 years ago. Perfect, I think literally here, perfect is the enemy of good. And with that, I think we should take Alexander first, and then we can continue with the result.